My perspective is with these natural disasters that are, in, and, and Thomas Fire has exactly predicted, this is exactly what all the models showed would happen in, the, in this new era of climate change that we're entering. <music>
Um, in the short term, that was great. There was more wood to, to turn into to chairs and things, but, but it set up this huge potential for massive scale fires. So, a lot, so whereas we used to have a, a tree and then a tree and a little bit of a, a, a stuff, a little bit of vegetation here where this, this would burn a little bit and, and the base of the tree would burn, but the tree would be okay. Now, um, much more often, we have a contiguous layer of stuff that can burn. And so instead of being numerous, frequent, small fires, we have this potential for these catastrophic fires. And so the Thomas Fire is an example of that. A lot of the stuff that burned, say, right behind the Mission, right behind City Hall in downtown Ventura, that stuff, that vegetation hadn't burned in 100 years or, or more, 100, 150 years or something. So that sets up the stage that when we do have a little bit of fire, if it's fueled by crazy, bizarre Santa Anas like we have rarely seen, we of course have Santa Anas, but they don't go for two, three, four weeks at a time like we were seeing here. That sets up this possibility where, where things sort of feed back on themselves. So this climate system is, is a feedback loop. And so more drought, things are drier, things are more likely to burn. We've suppressed fire, and so now we have all this pent up fuel, more likely to burn. Thomas fire is, is exactly what we'd expected to see and is most likely a harbinger of what is to come. As of right now, as we're recording this in 2018, the Thomas Fire is the largest recorded fire in California history. We started recording stuff in 1931, so the first records are 1932, um, so the largest fire since then. And it will unfortunately probably not last for super long. Within a decade or so, we'll, we will probably have something bigger, or at least instances across the state of California where something will rival the scale of Thomas Fire. This is the reality that, that we've been dealt. This is the reality that we've chosen by, by um, choosing to be, um, in my opinion, um, uh, very short-sighted and, and not deal with this issue of, amongst other things, climate change um, and, and other factors as well. But, but because we've chosen to not deal with that situation, we're inheriting these unintended consequences. Clearly no one, I don't believe anybody wanted the Thomas fire to happen. I don't believe anybody wants to see huge waves of environmental refugees and, 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 and dislocated businesses and all that kind of stuff. But that is absolutely what's, what's happening. So um, as we saw with New Orleans in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina, as we're seeing with, with uh, in 20, starting in December of 2017 going on in 2018 with the Thomas fire, this really is going to become the new normal. Where, where, and one of the things that we're studying now, we, we don't have all the data, so we can't say it's definitively happening, but, but it's looking pretty clear. For example, drawing on some lessons from 20, the 2013 fire, the Springs fire, Camarillo Springs fire, that burned through our campus on the edge of the western Santa Monica Mountains. These old rules that people, so people will say what I just said, oh yeah, you know, um, uh, drought and, and these fire, uh, these communities that have evolved with fire, they're used to this fire and that's okay. Um, because in the past, for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years when we've studied this, when we do have a fire, uh, the, the plants bounce back. It might take a year or two, but you know, eventually they're going to come back. They, as I mentioned before, some of these actually need fire. The problem is um, it is very dangerous, and this is, I think, a general lesson from the Thomas fire and these other natural large-scale natural disasters. It's very, 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 very dangerous to use the past as a guide, and that's very natural for us. So, um, for example, okay, so th this little hillside built, burnt up 20 years ago, and it was, yeah, it was kind of dark and, and devegetated for a, a few years, but then everything came back. It's not clear that's going to happen. Um, of course, plants will come back. We're not going to lose all our oak trees or anything, but um, everything is tied to in the case of our vegetation here in, in coastal Southern California, tied to water. As we're getting less and less rain, the potential for this whole community to bounce back relatively quickly, that ain't happening. And so in the case of our 2013 fire, we have a plant called Dudleya viridii, a little, little small rare plant, not widely distributed. It was only found in the western Santa Monica Mountains. And we've, this is work we've been doing with a bunch of partners from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, all, all, all around, um, great, great uh, collaborations. Before the um, fire happened, it's hard to know exactly, but these, these critters were all over the place. You know, 50,000 individuals on, on, on over many miles of this, of this area of the Santa Monica Mountains. Afterwards, we have maybe 200 individuals. We've seen very little recovery. So one of our jobs is to figure out how to restore these plants. It, stuff we've tried has not worked. And so if we take that analogy and apply that to the large swath of the Thomas fire, it's at least safe to say the vegetative recovery is going to be much 
slower than you would predict just from you know, sort of first principles. And again, it's because this whole system is changing. And that has all kinds of knock-on effects. So that means less, less plants on the ground, say a year from now, than we would have predicted if this had happened 20 years ago. And then if there's less plants uh, in this particular area, that's less area for um, you know, squirrels and chipmunks and voles and, and critters to eat. Then if there's fewer of those guys, there's less forage for bobcats and, and, and coyotes and all those guys. So, so again, we are this interconnected system and we can't just tweak one thing. Um, but we are so grounded in our personal experience that when it comes to interpreting risk, we really um, have a hard time envisioning something different. And it takes something like um, you know, some crazy science fiction novel or some crazy dystopian narrative to get people to sort of think, well, geez, I hope that doesn't happen. And so, so the, again, the world isn't over. No, nothing's going to be a moonscape forever, but, um, but things are changing. And it will lead to unintended, always with these disasters, unintended consequences, but also unintended uh, 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 evolution, uh, unintended synergies will go in different ways. So we're, we're monitoring wildlife now, but um, one thing that could happen we'll probably see, we're already starting to see this, but we'll probably see for a longer period, more nuisance critters in town. So more nuisance critters in downtown Ventura, in downtown Ojai, in these areas, because there isn't as much for either, either uh, vegetation for them to eat or prey items if they're, if they're you know, a bobcat or something. So they're gonna tend to come more into town and they're gonna tend to have more interactions, some of which is positive and kids see a coyote and like, that's cool maybe not so excitement, exciting if it's, a, if it's a starving critter and you have a little kid around a, fo a you know, cat, cat food dish and, and the critter is trying to get the cat. So, so, so all that kind of stuff will, will change. Um, also, for those of us that really see the natural world not just as a utilitarian source, but as a place where we go to recharge our batteries, you know, take that soul enriching hike or, or just rela you know, relaxing um, bike ride after work or whatever the case may be is different, right? It is different. And as, as just the physical landscape has changed, without that recovery of that vegetation, it's more likely to have, er we're more likely to have um, erosion. Trails go out, harder for folks to recreate. And the young kids won't matter. They'll hike over whatever, they'll climb whatever. But the folks that um, you know, maybe do need a more stable path to walk on, it's gonna be that much harder for, say, the elderly couple to go hand in hand up the hillside or, or the person in a wheelchair that really needs a, a more, a more well-maintained type of trail. So there's all kinds of, of consequences with this. And another one that's, I can't stress enough that, that really is, and again, this is, this is we're very talking short term, you asked six months, so this is very, very short term. Um, how we talk to our fellow citizens is incredibly important. So, I mean, particularly at the scale of one of these large scale disasters where really it's a, it's a paramilitary command structure that we have, an incident command structure that's very useful, that works well for getting folks to the, to the lines to put out the fire, et cetera. Doesn't tend to work too well, in my experience, with getting information flowing back out. And again, it's not, not a nefarious thing of the authorities, but it, it can seem that way to residents. They want to know. So we have all these fantastic maps as, as to where the flood might be. They should be up online for everybody, interactive, all this and that. And we've made some, made some strides for there, but that wasn't there. And so when folks wanted to know where is the risk, we just had an event uh, two weeks ago, two, two or so weeks ago up at, up at Poinsettia Pavilion, which was great. Wonderful federal agencies were there, consultants were there. If people wondered how they can deal with on their own property in the wake, there, there were great sort of conceptual answers, very practical answers, all kinds of stuff. And there were some fantastic maps that were there. And what I saw time and time again was everybody pulling out their cell phones, taking photos where their house was in Ventura or Ojai or wherever, because they wanted to know how, how is my house in the really risky zone or is it on the edge zone? And now those maps are up, which is great. So now you, folks can access those through a variety of resources. There's stuff in Santa Barbara, there's stuff in Ventura. But to get that stuff, and, and of course, people like me want to make sure we're correct. We don't want to put out erroneous information or incorrect information. But in these disaster situations, it, the information is oftentimes so clamped down, right? We don't want to release the names. We don't want to release the addresses. We don't want to, um, you know, how many houses were destroyed. You know, all those things which seem very small and minor, but to folks that are displaced, to folks from the impacted communities, they're, they're huge. And, and it tends to breed, in my experience, it tends to breed distrust. 
not so much in Thomas Fire, but in, in the hurricanes, in the refugio spill, all that kind of stuff, where you're looking around and you see that, oh my gosh, there's all the houses in my neighborhood are gone. How many structures are burnt? 229. Like, what? 229? What are you talking That's like on my block, there's 229. So that, that sort of honest flow of information, it's, it, there is no perfect answer. But to be better about communicating stuff, that's, that's, the easy, that's the lowest bar, that's the first bar. That, I'd like to see that happen. We're making some strides in that. So at the city level, at the county level, that's great. Second, another important one I think that we need to talk about, and, and this is about the right time to talk about it, is um, how we deal with risk broadly. Uh, you know, many folks have insurance on their house. Many people are playing, pay, and we, again, we see this in Houston, we see this in New Orleans, we see this in Ventura, we see it everywhere. People say, hey, this is my house. I go to my state farm agent or whoever it is, and you know, what do I need to get? And you, need, you do or don't need X, Y, and Z. And so, okay, and then I pay him or her uh, my check, right? And when the disaster comes, like, where's my house being fixed? The vast majority of folks will not be made whole. And the way the policies work, um, they will not get uh, the, 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 the current rebuild value of their homes that they need. And, and, and not that everybody has to have their homes rebuilt, but, but I think most folks have gone to this social contract thinking that, um, hey, I'll, I'll, I, I'm doing my deal, di due diligence, I'm giving these folks this money, and they're going to give me peace of mind that if my car has an accident, if my house burns down, whatever. And what we've had in the, in the insurance industry, by and large, in the U.S. over the last 20 years is this massive conversion of the industry uh, in a couple of ways. But one, one of which is, is to be m more of them are more publicly traded and they're being held to this got to show profit every, every quarter. And it's, it's a bit less of a member of the community trying to make you whole. And so, so all these things that are inserted. And so if you want to know what the real risk of climate change is, right, that you talk to the insurance industry. So they, they each large uh, uh, independent uh, agency, but then also there's these think tanks where these folks get together. And they know very well. They, they, don't, they don't play the political games. They go, sea levels are rising. Um, you know, droughts are more common. And they work that into their calculations. Their actuarial tables are, are fantastic. So they, they fund a whole lot of academic research. Um, from folks like me, because they say, you know, this is here's an unknown. Can you please tell us what happens when you have a drought and a big fire? And so, so they're trying to figure out for because the, their planning window is 50 years, you know, 50 years. Well, at least up, you know, 30-year mortgage, but but you know, more like 30, 40, 50 years. What's their exposure going forward with climate change? Their basic answer has been to expose themselves less. So do so in the contract. Make sure it says that we're only going to pay X amount of money that we, we will not cover X, we will not cover Y. And so what people are finding now is, is initially, initially, they're, they're not being made whole financially when they thought they were. And the insurance guys just say, you weren't reading your contract, right? But you know, in the next couple months, as people finally get their houses cleaned up whenever and start to rebuild, um, and then actually do rebuild, and then they try to get insurance again, that's going to be another huge uh, avalanche in terms of in terms of a discussion in our society, that pe some people just won't be able to get insurance, or at least won't be able to get insurance at, at what they would consider an affordable rate. And so that conversation needs to happen, which is, um, are we going to have more publicly subsidized stuff like we have with our, with our earthquake fund, which is mostly a joke. So the earthquake fund will not cover a significant earthquake, but small earthquakes can handle small earthquakes. So do we want to go that route? Do we want to change the rules as a society for how insurance works? And so this infrastructure that we need as a society is vulnerable. The, the flip side, the benefit, is that the, our insurance colleagues are signaling us what we should do. Not have houses up on the hill, not have the power plant on the beach or whatever. Um, but we have to decide if that's what we want. And we probably should pull that stuff out of the coastal zone or out of the steepest hillside. But telling someone that has their own property on the hillside that, no, why don't you just leave there? It's very, very, it's super easy to do that when it's, the crazy, silly folks that quote unquote live below sea level in New Orleans, I can't, I shouldn't rebuild that. It's much harder when it's us. And so the story, I was in, I was doing a project in, in Malibu, uh, like 2007. And so New, the New Orleans story was still ripe. And so there had just been a big fire in Malibu. A bunch of the, the giant mansions had burned. And so I, I happened to go into um, a coffee shop and was getting a coffee. And there were two um, wealthy older ladies in line in front of me talking very loud. I was not trying to eavesdrop, but, but you could hear them. And so they said, and they were talking about, um, uh, there was a thing in the newspaper the day before. So, there was, so the New Orleans was on everybody's mind. And 
And they say, oh, it's so horrible what happened to those poor folks in New Orleans. Ah, oh, yeah, ah, oh, shouldn't have built below sea level. They didn't build below sea level. Um, the city has been sinking for a whole variety of, because we're pumping oil and gas, but that's another story. But so basically they said, oh, you know, those poor people shouldn't have, shouldn't, they shouldn't, you know, feel for them, they shouldn't rebuild. That's so stupid. Like, I can't believe, we, sh we shouldn't allow those people to go, you know, build back the way they did. And they talk for, and normally I would jump in, but I was like, you know, I, I'm tired. I don't really want to get into another one of these conversations. So then they talk about a couple other things. And then a minute or two later, they turn to what happened in that fire here in Southern California. And so this one woman said uh, that, that her house had, had her, her closet, if it hadn't burned down, mostly it burned up, but it was severely impacted. So this one lady said, oh, so if you have the estimates yet for your rebuild, she goes, yeah, it's going to be whatever it was, you know, $3 million or something. And, um, and so then she, the first lady said, oh my gosh, that's so much money. So are you guys going to rebuild? And instantly, of course we're rebuilding. You know? So, so, so it, you know, we need to see this at a, in a broader perspective. And, and sometimes it happening to us makes us more willing to, and more open to some of those discussions. Immediate short term to deal with, if we're just talking about fire, um, I would say um, get real about using fire. So controlled burns are one of the, the tools that we have to, and to be clear, humans have used fire for thousands of years, well over 10,000 years in California alone. So the Native Americans used it to, for example, instead of having a big grove of a bunch of small oak trees that make little acorns, kill all the babies really quickly without having to do any chopping or whatever, kill all the babies and leave a couple big mama trees there that make big honking acorns, where instead of having to spend eight hours picking up acorns, you can spend an hour and get as much food. So Yosemite Valley looks exactly the way it looks because we've been actively burning uh, Yosemite Valley for centuries. What I would like to do is get to the point where we could actually use that as a management tool. We do do controlled burns now in California and, and the West, but the bureaucracy is completely out of control. So when I first went up to Stanford as a postdoc and started working on some of these issues, um, I went to 19 different control, supposedly controlled burns until I saw my first one because every single one was called off, called off the day before or the day of. One of the problems is when we do have these fires, it will be smoky, right? And so first and foremost, we've, we mostly have shifted are burning to the wet time of the year, which doesn't have the same ecological consequences when a fire happens, say, during the summer. Um, and we do that so we can more easily control the fire. One, two, again, insurance. Um, we have had a few instances where some control burns got out of control and, and caused more problems. And then everybody sues the state up the wazoo and you're such an idiot and blah, 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 blah. We need to see fire less as a, as a random thing or unusual event and more of a commonplace occurrence. So the term is that, that some people use for this is fire farming. We need to do more fire farming. So, so not massive scale, but small. Burn a little patch here, burn a little patch there. And we have to acknowledge that if we don't do this, the problems will be even worse than they are. Usually these things are called off by air quality control boards. So they're saying, oh my gosh, you're going to put up so much soot and it's so hot and the air is so still, it's going to cause people with asthma. Da, da. I mean, we had four weeks. Uh, I mean, some of my students left and went home to Bakersfield and other places because they could not breathe uh, across the whole of the county, whether it's, you know, Thousand Oaks or, or Ventura, whatever. So, so as long as we're saying, you know, if we're going to say we're worried about people breathing, you have to say what's the consequence of weeks and weeks and weeks of folks unable to ingest air in their home, right? So, so that, that takes um, accepting more risk. Right? So be, understand that every once in a while, we don't want it to happen, but who knows what the percentage is. A couple percent of the time, some of these control burns will get out of control. You know, understanding that that's a better deal than, than spending all of our budget uh, for an entire year on one fire in terms of our state budget. That would be one thing. I'd say, let's get to control burns. Well, let's, be, let's allow us to use that management tool. Uh, next, I would say, um, while we cannot restore the entirety of the whole land, it's just too, too massive an area to restore, um, there are nevertheless pockets that we can jumpstart some of that restoration. So we can't do all you know, this whole 10 mile by 10 mile area, but we can go into a small area that's a quarter mile by a quarter mile and create a little you know, oasis, if you will, for wildlife, for, for rare plants and things. And that's totally doable. A lot of our fantastic agencies, uh, Ventura Land Trust, Ojai Valley Land Conservancy, a lot of these folks are beginning the process and supporting those folks. So again, it won't be everywhere in the landscape fixed, but having some key nodes where the bobcats can hang out, where the deer can hang out, um, and, and or where we can understand the story, we can tell ourselves the story of the fire 
and, and, and show our kids. There might not be, this plant might not be along the hillside anymore, but have some, some example spots. And so I'd say um, really focusing on these um, uh, smaller scale recovery efforts is key. Um, uh, next, I would say um, to get, um, you know, to really get serious about planning for the next phase. So because such a large area burned and because the vegetation is going to recover so slowly, we will see mudslides for, for years to come in the wake of this fire. I mean, one of the, the videos that I was showing um, my students, it was a, a Prius sort of, sort of surfing down a road down in, down in LA, um, was a consequence of a fire nine months beforehand, right? So, so it's not just the, the, the risk of these mud flows and, 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 um, and debris flows and things isn't just in the immediate wake it's going to extend for years. And so if we can get more serious about that, better maps, um, better forecasting, that's great. And, and, and our, our specifically Ventura County has been doing a fantastic job. So they don't, they not only now have some maps and some this and that, they also have instrumented and so you can actually go on to some of our websites on the county now and actually see the real time rainfall data. And that's what's feeding into the fire department and our Office of Emergency Services and those folks. So they're seeing the same stuff. GIS-based resource planning, um, remote data collection, that's actually really, really key. And so, so beefing up that part of the county, the city, wherever our jurisdiction is, that, that's also going to be key. And then, and then again, the insurance, talking about um, let's be honest so people, you know, encourage folks, and some of this is starting, encourage folks to go look at your house, at your policy right now. And, and it's super boring, it's lame, it's super small letters and all that horrible crap. But let's look at it and read it and let's see what, what risk I'm at. And if the only dialogue is between the folks whose house was burned, we're going to lose that battle. If we have a much broader discussion across the county, across the state, and people say, oh my gosh, if I have a fire or a whatever mudslide, I might be screwed too, that will really lead to more change. Um, and, and having more honest conversation about that, um, I think, is key. Ventura County, I'm very optimistic. California, fairly optimistic. Federal, extremely pessimistic. For all of our faults in Ventura County, um, we have some fantastic public servants here. And I've, I've worked in many areas of the world, many areas of the US. I, I'm not just blowing smoke here. I mean, these folks really, really do. I don't agree with them all the time, but they really work extremely hard. They are trying to think outside the box. They're trying to do the good, the, the fight the good fight. And I really do believe that the vast majority of our representatives, both elected and non-elected, um, our public servants do a fantastic job locally. But I mean, I get calls all the time from folks that want to know about SOAR, that want to know about our wildlife movement corridor uh, you know, overlays, all these things that sometimes can seem like, oh man, those crazy weirdos are doing this other weird thing again. We're trying, they're, they're really trying to get out in front of this. When we, when we did an a, um, effort with the Nature Conservancy to map uh, uh, climate change flood risk, that was the first place on the West Coast that we did that, right? So Vin they, they chose Ventura. That, you know, T TNC could have done it in San Francisco, in Seattle, wherever. They chose Ventura because we were so um, active in terms of dealing with these challenges and not burying our head in the sand.